All right, well, today we're going to be in the book of Judges today. And we're going to uh, be in chapter 6, and we're going to look at the first 27 verses. I was tempted to cover like six chapters today, but God said, no, not today, not today. Uh, but many of you, if you guys know the book of Judges, you know kind of how it works, right? It's a, it's a cycle of disobedience. Really, if, you, if, in, in, if at every chapter of this book, you will read, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, they would do evil. The, the Lord will punish their disobedience by sending a, a foreign nation to them to, to oppress them. They will cry out to God, and God will deliver them through men or, or a woman um, who were called judges. And throughout this book, you will see that pattern, that cycle. But really, in the book of Judges, as much as we can look at it and see the violence, the wickedness, the evil, it really isn't about that. It really is about how God is a faithful God. Even, even when we are so unfaithful to him, even when we rebel and betray him, God is still faithful and, and long-suffering towards his people, and how God is, is persistent in getting his people back in fellowship with him. And so today, I, I kind of want to look at one of the judges, and, and, and this particular judge, is, he is talked about in about two chapters. So he's a pretty significant character here, and his na- obviously his name is Gideon. Um, and I believe that he's a, he's, he's a person that we can all relate to because ever since I read his story, it always, he, his character just captivated me. It interests me because I'm like, man, I'm, I'm kind of like him. Afraid, doubtful sometimes, constantly asking God for confirmation. And I'm like, man, this is, this, this is a, a, a character, a person who I believe we can all glean from. So... Before we start our study, pray with me, and then we'll get into it. So there, Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for this evening. We thank you for worship, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for your spirit, Lord, who we know that is, he is here with us, that he is, he is upon us, Lord, in us. But we also believe, God, that your son is here amongst us as well, Lord. I pray that, that you is, teach us, that it's you, Father God, that that, that just have that word for us, Lord. Touch our hearts. Help us to stay attentive. Give us the ears to hear. Give us the mind to focus, Father God, and to understand, Lord. And use me as a vessel, Father, as um, incapable as I am, Lord. Just use me, God, to just to show how good, powerful, and mighty you are, Lord. I love you, God. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <clears throat> All right, so Judges chapter 6. Starting at verse 1, it says, Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian for seven years, and the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. You know, at the end of chapter 5, we read that Israel had peace for 40 years. And, And really, this came after a season of hardship for them. The Israelites... Back to that cycle. The Israelites disobeyed God by worshiping false idols. God used the Canaanites to to correct them. They cry out to God, and God calls a judge, Deborah in particular, to to deliver Israel from the Canaanites. And so she did, and now the Israelites have peace for 40 years. But after the 40 years, we now read that the Israelites once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And as a result, God delivered Israel to the hands of the Midianites. And now the Midianites have had a long history with Israel. You know, they were the descendants of Abraham through his wife, Keturah. So this group uh, group of people were, were distantly related to the Israelites. And we also see in Genesis that they were the ones who bought Joseph from his brothers, also, Moses, Moses' wife was a Midianite, and it was the Midianites who hired Balaam to put a curse on Israel. So these, these, these group of characters are not new. They're, they're 
constantly within the life of the Israelites here. And now we see them being used by God to, to punish Israel. And they are used for, for quite some time. It says that, they, that the Israelites were in the hands of the Midianites for seven years. Now, it was, it's going to be a rough seven years for the Israelites. So let's continue in verse 2. It says, Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds which are in the mountains. You know, it got so bad for Israel that they had to hide from the Midianites. Dens, caves, they had to hide in the mountains. And they couldn't be out in the open because of just how fearful they were uh, towards the Midianites. So verse 3, it says, So it was, when if, whenever Israel had sown, Midianites would come up. Also, uh, Amalekites and the people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock in their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number. They would enter the land to destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. You know, the Midianites and their allies, they would in, enter into Israel and take everything they had. Take their food, they would take their animals, and then they would destroy everything they had as well, their homes. And the people of Israel would be left with nothing. I mean, really, though, the, this, is, this is the consequences of sin, though. You know, their sin left them destroyed. It left them with no sustenance. It left them greatly impoverished. And that is the true result of sin, is it not? It, it destroys us. It, it, it destroys those around us. It leaves us with nothing, and it leaves us empty. That's exactly what the Israelites were facing. And what astonishes me is, 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 is how quick sin can ruin everything. I don't know about you guys, but I'll just you, things are going great, and then you something happened, you do something, and then great, the day is over. All right? I can remember a couple of times going out on a nice date with my wife. You know, things are going good. I say something that is not smart, <laughs> and almost instantly the day is ruined. <laughs> All right. You know, for 40 years, Israel had everything. They had peace. They had joy, victory. They had food, water, homes to live in. But within seven years, all of that was taken away from them. Their peace, their joy, their food, their comforts. Israel is now in this place because of their disobedience. God is, is disciplining them. But here's the good thing, though. After the, the, the chastening of the Lord, the Israelites did at least one thing right, and that is they cried out to the Lord. And you know, it, it is never, ever, ever too late to cry out to the Lord. I mean, for these guys, it took seven years of oppression for them to finally get to that point, to cry out to God. But God is so gracious he is so merciful, so loving, because God could have completely ignored this, this group, the Israelites. He could have been so fed up with them. I mean, this what would have been the fifth time already that, that, that the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. I mean, God has every right to say, you know what? I am done with you. I'm going to throw a nuclear bomb on this nation and be done with it. But instead, God is so patient with us, so gracious and so loving. I mean, no matter what we do or how bad we mess up, we can always cry out to God. You know, when we keep telling ourselves how much of a disappointment we are to God, or, how, or, how, or if we keep falling into the same sin over and over and over again and, and believe that God is just fed up with us, guys, know that God is gracious. He's gracious. 
in those moments of failures, in those moments of despair, we can cry out to God and he will respond. And as much as we ourselves may be fed up with the Israelites constantly messing up, God is not like that. Because we see him respond to their cries in verse 7. It says, And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you out of the house of bondage. And I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all who oppressed you and drove them out before you and gave you their land. Also, I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But here's the key. You have not obeyed my voice. You know, before God does something, before he delivers Israel, he wants them to know why. Why they're in the situation they are in. And he tells them that the reason that they're in is not because of the Midianites, not because they're evil, it's not because they're greedy, but it's because they have not obeyed his voice. It's no one else's fault. They can't blame God. They can't blame the Midianites. They they can only blame themselves. But the Lord doesn't just leave them there with that correction. Right? I mean, again, it's fair enough to say, this this is all your fault. You take care of it. I'm leaving. No, the Lord is gracious and, again, patient with his people. You know, we're going to see that he actually is going, going to set up another judge, but an unlikely judge at that. But, you know, what I believe, I I believe that there are two important things that we are to take away from the the first 10 verses. The first thing is that God is, again, so loving and faithful towards his people, so just and, and righteous, that he won't allow his people to live in sin comfortably. I mean, we see that with the Israelites. Now, it's because of his love that he corrects his children. Does it hurt? Absolutely. But God is here. He, he's, he loves his people that he cannot bear to see them live in their sin. But at the same time, God has to be fair. God has to be just and punish sin. The second thing is that we, as his people, are to set our eyes on God. You know, the, the Israelites... Again, for those 40 years, things were going great for them. They had peace. They had everything they wanted. But at the end of of, of those 40 years, I I believe they took their eyes off of God. And because of that, it led them to disobedience. And then, then it led them to the punishment. And I think what we are to learn is that our eyes should always, always be on the Lord. Even when things are good, when, when even if you're on the mountaintop, Keep your eyes on the Lord. I believe it's even more so when we're on the mountaintops that our eyes should remain on the Lord. Because we have to remember that we have an enemy roaming around like a lion, looking to whom he may devour. Let's not get distracted with the victories and the success. Let's not get distracted with of, of the view of the mountaintop. Because if we get distracted, that, that tumble down into the valley is, is painful. Let's continue to walk steadfastly and, and, and abide in his word. But now we're going to see who it is that God raises up to, to free the Israelites from their oppression. And we read it in verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the, the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. So who is the man that's going to free Israel from their oppressors? Gideon, the man who was hiding in the winepress. Not quite the hero we expect here, right? 
Because I don't know if you know anything about threshing wheat, but you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. And you're probably, why, why not? Well, when you, to thresh wheat, you need wind to blow off the chaff. And you don't get that wind in a wine press, which is practically a, a massive basin. So threshing wheat would have been a difficult task for Gideon here. But why? Look, look at the reason why he was doing it in the wine press. It's not because he's not a smart man, but it was because he was afraid of the Midianites. Gideon is, is, was a fearful person. He was afraid that if the Midianites saw him threshing the wheat, that they would go take, uh, take his grain away and even potentially kill him for it. Now, you may be also be asking, well, who is this angel of the Lord that is talking to Gideon? Well, I, I believe that this is Jesus before his incarnation. Because we're going to see later on in our study that, that, that the angel of the Lord accepts worship. But it's this angel of the Lord who called Gideon a mighty man of valor. A mighty man of valor? I mean, this guy is hiding He's afraid of the Midianites. I mean, he's really the exact, the exact opposite of valor. But the Lord saw something in this man. He saw who Gideon would become, and the Lord calls him a mighty man of valor. Now, I don't know about you, but aren't you glad that the Lord sees us as who he will make us to be and not who we are now? I, I sure am. Because in my current state, I, I see how incapable I am, I, 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 how fearful I can be. But yet the Lord calls us based on who he, uh, we will become, on who he will make us to be. You know, I think about what Jesus told Peter and Andrew when he first called them. You guys remember what he said? He says, come and I will make you fishers of men. You know, at that time, Peter was, let's just say, a handful, right? He wasn't fishing for man, rather for men's ears, right? He was, he was good at cutting uh, men's ears off. But we, then we see this man change completely. We see him in the book of Acts drawing a total of 8,000 people to the Lord. And even in our sun, Sunday studies, I mean, we see Peter's heart of humility, his heart for, for God's people to be a light. And I am sure Peter or any of the, of the disciples thought that Peter would not be used in such a way that this guy would, he was going to get in trouble for sure. But we also see Paul, right? When God called Paul, he was on his way to murder more Christians. His title was a murderer. But yet Jesus saw who Paul would become, a man who would be sold out for Christ, a man who who God could use to spread his message of hope. God knew that. God didn't call him, hey, murderer, you want to you wanna share my message? No. And, and that's so encouraging to me because even in my blunders, even when, when I fall so badly, Jesus still sees me for who I will become. Jesus still, still sees you for who you will become. And it's so motivating to me and, 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 encouraging, and encouraging to me because God, this is really, this is a sign that God will work in me, will work in you. That he will change me, reshape me, making me more like Christ every day. I mean, Philippians 1, 6 tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he who begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You know, how, how do you see yourself now? I mean, do you, do you see yourself as a, as a failure? Do you see yourself as, as weak, as a disappointment? No, that, that, that's not how God sees you. God does not see you in that light. You know, in Christ, God sees you as more than a conqueror. He sees you as his child. He sees you as victorious. And we, as, as his people, we can go out, walk this life, being confident in that very same thing. But 
it seems that Gideon here had an issue with what God has said to him. And we're going to read what that issue is in verse 13. It says, Gideon said to him, O my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where were all his miracles which our fathers told us about? saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? You know, when, when the angel of the Lord tells Gideon that the Lord was with him, Gideon immediately asks the why. If God is with us, then why is this happening? If God is with us, then where has he been? Why are things going the way they are going? Where are the miracles? Where are his promises? I thought we were his people. God is not with us. He has forsaken us. If God is for me, if he hasn't left me nor forsaken me like the Bible tells me, then why am I in this situation? Why am I struggling financially? Why is my marriage dying? Why are my children rebelling? Why don't I have this? Why don't I have that? Why, why, why? I mean, have you guys ever asked those similar questions? I, I know I have, if I were to be honest. But realize, realize that the angel of the Lord, God, doesn't answer Gideon's questions. He kind of completely just disregards those questions. Rather, he tells them, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Gideon's probably like, so are you going to answer my question or not? Right? And I believe that the, probably the reason why he God didn't answer Gideon's questions because he already answered it in verse 10. He told them, he sent a prophet to them saying that it was because of their disobedience. The answer to the why is your disobedience. This is why. Maybe Gideon wanted a different answer. Maybe he didn't accept the fact that they were sinful people, disobedient children. Like many of us try to have God answer our prayers differently after he already answered it. Right? We're like, okay, God said no, but if I, what if I go to the prayer group on Wednesday and pray? He may say yes. Or if I put it in and have someone else pray for me, maybe he'll say yes. Or, if I, or maybe I just have to ask in a different way. Maybe his answer will change. But no. We see that God didn't give Gideon a different answer. He, probably, he didn't answer it at all, which shows to me that the answer remains the same because of their disobedience. But realize that God do, did respond to the very last part of Gideon's statement, though, where Gideon says, but now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Now, God responds to this very same thing, and he tells Gideon that I haven't forsaken you. That is a lie. I have not forsaken you. The Lord is with you. I am sending you to deliver the Israelites from the hands of the Midianites. I am sending you. I mean, what an encouragement to, to, this would be to, to Gideon, who was afraid and, and hiding in a wine press, right? To know that, okay, okay, maybe, maybe the Lord is with me. He is here. This, 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 this person, this angel of the Lord, is telling me that God hasn't forsaken us. But we see that, that, that this encouragement statement does not quite help Gideon. He still needs a, a, a sense, a little help to understand that what he's being called to. In verse 15, it says, So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how... Can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. 
And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Now Gideon was honest. He was like, I'm not the strongest person. My tribe is the least. I am the weakest even in my family. But I, I really do enjoy, I love this, because how many of us feel like Gideon? That we are the least among us that we are completely incapable of doing anything for God simply because of who we are, what we've done, the type of gifts that we have or don't have. I mean, I, I, I feel like this all the time. Incapable, the weakest. And I'm like, Lord, are you sure you call the right person? But yet the Lord is still gracious enough to remind us that yes, but also that it's not about us. That it's not about us. It's not about who we are or what we have done or, or what gifts we have, but it's all about him. He is the one that will provide all that is necessary for us to do what he's called us to do. We, and we come to him like, Lord, it's all about me. I don't have this. I am the weakest. I, I, I. But the Lord says, well, it's not about you, bro, in my language. He says, it's about me. I'm the one who's going to give you the gifts. I'm the one who's going to make you into a, a man, of a, a mighty man of valor. And Gideon is so funny because we, we see that he still struggles with this. He's still doubtful. He's doubtful in accepting what God wants to do through him. So, so, he, so he's going to ask for a confirmation, in a sense. And, we, and we're going to read this in verse 17. It says, Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring out my offering and set it before you. And he said, I will wait until you come back. So Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah of flour. The meats he put in a basket, and he put the broth in the pot. And he brought them out to him under the terebinth tree and presented them. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened bread and lay them on this rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put out the end of, of the staff that was in his hand and touched the meat and the unleavened bread. And the fire rose out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened bread. And the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Realize the beauty of this act of worship. L look at it. Gideon wanted a sign to confirm that the, that, that the one is speaking to him is of God. He goes to his house, prepares a sacrifice to present it to the angel of the Lord. And what makes it so beautiful? Because we have to remember that the people of Israel didn't have much food at this time. They were poor. A lot of it, most of the food was taken away from them. Their grain, their animals, all of it was, was, was in the hands of the Midianites. What little they had, they either had to hide it from the Midianites or they had to ration it. But here, Gideon goes and prepares a young goat and unleavened bread from an ephah, which is essentially a basket of flour. So this is a lot of flour. This food would have been valuable to him and his household. But he prepares it for the Lord and brings it to God. And God said, lay that out and pour it out. Pour out the broth. And Gideon did, the Lord touched it with his staff, and immediately the sacrifice was consumed. And one, looking at this, we could think, man, what a waste. Like that just, poof, poof, there it goes. Well, there goes the food, there goes the bread, the meat, there goes the whole goat. Great. No leftovers. Right, Good, Gideon could have eaten that. He could have sold the goat for, for a lot of money. He could have done this. He could have done that. What a waste of food. All that cheese. Why did he do that? Because it was an act of worship. 
And you know, oftentimes people criticize, are, are criticized for their act of worship. Even Christians criticize other Christians for their act of worship. You know, I, I think of Mary who, who came to the feet of Jesus and took that very expensive oil and poured it all over his feet. All of the disciples, particularly, particularly Judas, were criticizing her, saying, what is she doing? What a waste. We could have just sold that and, and given the money to the poor, as if that was his main concern. But you see, guys, worship is costly. And many people don't understand that. They ask us, why do you spend so much time at church? Why do you give so much to the church? Why do you have to take your Christian faith so seriously? Why? Because my God is worth every bit of it. That is why. And Gideon realized that. If this, is the, if this is God who is talking to me, then he is worth every bit of food that I have. And as Christians, this is how we are to live. A life that is consumed by God. A life that is poured out for God. And that is why Paul says in Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And you know, many people won't like that. Many people won't like that we are consumed for God, that we are, that we are poured out for God. They're not going to like that. But you know what? Who cares? Who cares if people don't like it? Because this is what God wants of us. He wants to consume us. He wants, to, he wants us entirely. He wants us to be poured out for him. So the question is, are we consumed by God? Is your life poured out for the Lord? Are we living a, wor a worshipful life? But now let's continue in verse 22. It says, Now Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, so Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. Then the Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an, art, an altar there to the Lord and called it, The Lord is Peace. And to this day is still the Ophra of, of the Abyssalites. Now realizing who he was speaking with, Gideon was afraid that he was going to die. Right? And I have a feeling that, that he probably had what God told Moses in his mind. You know, remember what, 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 what God said. He, said. he said, you cannot see my face for no man shall live. Right? So Gideon was like, great. I saw the angel of the Lord. I'm going to die. But God said, rest assured, Gideon. No, I'm, I'm going to have to use you. Obviously, you're not going to die. All right? So in response, Gideon builds God an altar and calls it the Lord is peace, Yahweh Shalom. So Gideon offers, he offered a sacrifice to the Lord, got his, the confirmation he needed, and he built an altar to God. But before Gideon goes out in the might of the Lord, God needs to do something in his life. God first needs to do some work closer to home. And we're going to read and finish up what that work is in verse 25. It says, Now it came to pass the same night that the Lord said to him, Take your fa father's young bull, the second bull of seven years old, and tear down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the wooden image that is beside it, and build an altar to the Lord your God on top of this rock in the proper arrangement, and take the second bull and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the image which you shall cut down. So Gideon took ten men from among his servants and did as the Lord had said to him. But because he feared his father's household and the men of the city too much to do it by day, he did it by night. Before Gideon goes out in the calling of God, Gideon needed to do some, some cleanup at his home. There's some things that, 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 that God was, that had to, to work on first. And just when Gideon thought that he had a difficult task of defeating the Midianites, 
God now asks Gideon to do something that is probably just as hard, destroying his father's altar to Baal. But you see, if Gideon was to free the Israelites and point them to God, then Gideon needed to start that devotion in his home. His home needed to be an example for the people to follow. I mean, could you imagine, right? Gideon goes, he fights the Midianites, defeats them. Yay, everyone's celebrating, right? He points them to, to, to God, but then he goes home and there's still the statue of Baal there. I mean, what kind of an example would that set for the rest of the nation? Oh, that it's okay, right? This duality, it's totally fine. We can worship God, we can worship Baal. I mean, look at Gideon, our leader. But I like that it says, that God says, in the proper arrangement. Things weren't in its proper arrangement. Things were out of order in the home of Gideon. And God God wasn't in his proper place in the home of Gideon. And, 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 I, and I really believe that what can hinder God from, from doing his work in us and through us is our lack of wanting to put things in its proper arrangement at home. And that could be in our marriage. God wanting to use our marriage as an example for other people to use, but there is a disorder within it. God has to work that out first. And even in our own walk, that in itself can be out of order. There could be things that, that we're holding on to, things that we're holding on to in the secret of our homes. And God said, before I use you, we have to work this out. You have to get rid of this. This is hindering you. This is, this is holding you down. And God is asking us to put those things in its proper arrangement. But I, I, I believe that we can become so comfortable and, and even accustomed to the disorder of our life where we, in a way, resist to have things in its proper order. We can make excuses like, well, this thing has been part of my life for such a long time. It's no big deal, Lord. It's, it won't interfere with the ministry. It won't interfere with our, with our relationship. Or, well, it's not really my problem. It's actually my brother's issue. Right? He, why don't you talk to him? Right? Because really, the altar did belong to Gideon's father, right? Gideon could have told him, well, that's not mine. Go talk to my dad. Tell him to remove it. But God instructed Gideon to remove it. Why? Because Gideon as the new leader, needed to set his home in order and needed to be an example for others to see. An example of holiness and an example of obedience. You know, I, I, I'm reminded of what Paul says in 1 Timothy 3, 5. He says, For if a man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Now I know that Paul here is speaking to the leaders of the church, but in some shape or form, we, all, we are all part of the ministry as well, though. I mean, we are called to, to encourage, to build up, to be a light, to be examples for the world to see. But how can we do that if our lives are out of place? Ministry starts in the home. It starts with us. It starts by removing those things in our life that, that are hindering us and hindering the work that God wants us to do and through us. And sometimes putting those things in order can be difficult. It can be hard. Because look how radical it was for Gideon. God tells him to take his father's bull and use it as a burnt offering. I mean, that's like taking your father's Porsche and crashing it, right? I mean, this was a big deal. And Gideon is to destroy the altar that his father built. And in its place, build an altar for the Lord use his father's prized bull as a burnt offering, and use the wood idol to start the fire for it. I mean, that's pretty tough stuff there. I mean, could you imagine doing that? I, honestly, I would be afraid. I would be like, oh, what? Can I just go and fight the Midianites? Like, like I'm okay with that, but to do this to my dad? I mean, he was afraid. Gideon was afraid. I mean, he took 10 guys with him, 
And, and he did what the Lord instructed at night because he was af too afraid to, to do it by day because people could see him do it. But what I, what I love about this, what I'm encouraged and even convicted about it is that although Gideon was afraid of the reaction of, of his household, his, of the neighbors, of his dad, this fear did not keep him from obeying God. He was like, okay, Lord, I'll do it, but can I take 10 guys and do it at night? Because I'm a little afraid here. And the Lord said, eh, that's fine, as long as you do it. You know, in, 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 many, in many ways, we, we, we can let fear keep us from doing what God has called us to do. Fear of how our family or friends would react if they saw us pray, if they saw us worship, if they saw us reading our Bibles, if they find out that we go to church. There's fear of, of messing up, of embarrassing ourselves, or whatever it is. We can let our fears supersede the call of God. But that shouldn't be the case. Yes, we can be fearful. I mean, we're humans. Yes, sometimes the things that God asks of us can be scary. But our devotion and worship to God should overcome that fear. And you know, I, I really believe this was a moment for Gideon where he had to trust and put his faith in what God told him. He's like, look, I confirmed it to you. You're, you're my guy. I am with you. Now I need you to, to do what I ask. Do you trust me? Then do this. If Gideon wants to do this difficult task, then he needed to lean and trust in the promises of God through the fear. And again, I, I like this because Gideon is, is so human, so real. I mean, he isn't painted to be this, this brave, unfearful, buff person. No, he's just like us in many ways. But yet we see how this young man placed his trust in God. He was afraid, but his trust in God was greater. And I am so encouraged by this because there are things that I don't want to do out of fear. There's things that I'm doubtful of, the things that, that I'm like, okay, Lord, I'm looking into myself. I'm so sorry, right? Like, but, but if this is what God has called me to do, then despite my fear, despite my doubts, despite what I lack, I need to trust and obey God and lean upon his promises. And, and you know, we can never go wrong in doing that. We can never go wrong in, in setting our eyes upon, upon Jesus. You know, in Gideon's story, people eventually did find out what he did. But God protected him. And God used him in a mighty way to deliver Israel from the Midianites. It wasn't easy for Gideon to trust in God. But God was patient with him. God continued to confirm to him in several other ways that this calling is for him. But sadly, at the end of Gideon's life, we see the consequences of taking our eyes off of God again. He led, he led the Israelites into idolatry. Why? Because his eyes started to be removed from God. You know, we can start off so well, but the goal is also to end well. The goal is to finish our race, guys. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I, I thank you for men like Gideon, God, so real, Lord, so honest, God, and, and Father, I just, we pray. We pray that we can be people, God, who just trust you, people who, who s will always set our eyes upon you, God. I pray, God, that, that we may be people, Lord, who just are examples of your holiness, God. Help us to be set apart, Lord. Help us to be a light in, in this world that we live in, Father. And Lord, we just, we just thank you also for your grace and for your mercy, Lord. God, you're so patient with us, God. We're unworthy of it, Lord. But we thank you, God, that you're so long-suffering, so kind, so loving, Lord. That you hear our cries, God, that you're so quick to repent, Lord. That we're so quick to forgive, Lord. So I just pray, Father God, that 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 you are glorified through our lives, Lord. 
that we may, as we start it well, Father, help us to end well as well, God. Help us to run and finish our race strong, Lord, setting our eyes on the prize, Lord, which is your Son. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.